Good morning and uh, welcome to the part two of our course modules. Part one has been completed with about, uh, I think, uh, 15 or 16 lessons. Now we move on to part two. Part two consists of the history of English literature. It's going to be a bit longer than part one. Let's then begin with the first lesson. Old English period or Anglo-Saxon period. We will see some of the features, historical background of this period. We will look at some important works of this period. And all those works appearing on the screen in front of you are very important. You must take down notes as usual. Okay. Now, look at the period, the timeline. Old English period extends from 410 CE. Instead of AD, the old AD is gone. CE, common era, to 1066 CE. What is this 1066 very famous for? That was the year when the Normans under William the Conqueror invaded England and established the Norman rule. We will talk about those later. So this is the timeline. 410 CE to 1066 CE. Old English period. Or known as Anglo-Saxon period. Some important events prior to this period. Very quickly we go over. Imagine the world was created either by God, as it is narrated in the Bible or other 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 uh, religious books of various religions around the world, or through Big Bang theory, whatever. The world was created. Man was created, woman was created, the, they multiplied and spread all over the world, all over the globe. And between 1500 BCE, before common era, and 500 BCE, Celtic tribes arrived in England. So, the original inhabitants of England were Celts, Celtic tribes. They came from nearby European countries like uh, maybe Denmark or the modern Denmark, or Germany or uh, Spain or other European countries. They settled down in England. So the original inhabitants of England were when we talk about WBX later, we will be talking about the Celtic revival. So if you keep in mind what these Celts were, they were, they were a, a group of people, a tribe of people, and they had their own culture, their own traditions and customs, which were uh, quite uh, attractive to whites like WBX from Ireland. So we have what is known as Celtic Revival in Edges Poetry. Before that, let's look at more features of what happened before the Old English period or Anglo Saxon period started. Now, this is very important. Romans conquered England in the year 43 CE and ruled for about, you know, as you can see, uh, 
nearly 500 years or so, or nearly 500 years. And they left England in 410 CE because their headquarters, Rome, was threatened by some barbarous uh, invasion. So they left England. Okay. After the departure of the Romans from England, three tribes came to England. Angles, Saxons and Jews and they in a way conquered the major part of England and divided different regions among themselves. Who were these people? They were three uh, predominant uh, Germanic tribes from modern Germany. Okay. That's what happened before the Anglo-Saxon rule began. So Anglo-Saxons are already here. Angles, Saxons and Jews. The name England, the name England came from these two names, Angles and Saxons. Angle land. Corrupted, corrupted, corrupted and became England. Okay. As I have already said, Romans left England in 410. And England was open to invasion by these three tribes, Angles and Saxons especially, and they occupied a major portion of England and established a rule there. Then Christianization of England began in 597 under the, under the patronage of St. Augustine. Don't mistake this Augustine with the Augustine of Hippo. That's a different Augustine. This Augustine was the first uh, Bishop of Canterbury. The rise of Wessex Kingdom under Alfred the Great. Alfred the Great was one of the great kings among the Anglo-Saxons. And he, he ruled the Wessex region. The establishment of the Dane law. What is this Dane law? We often come across this term in, in, in any history book on English literature. See, a major portion of of Eastern England was under the reign, under the influence or rule of Danish Vikings. They were from Denmark. A group of, a tribe of people, Vikings, they were very really barbarous. They were in fact uh, sort of aggressive uh, sea pirates. They invaded almost all the, all the European uh, countries those days or regions and their main purpose was to, to to amass wealth. But when they found England a uh, very fertile soil, they settled down. And where most of the eastern part uh, and some of the northern part were under their influence. And they established their rules and laws, traditions, customs. And that together is known as Dane law. Get the point? Okay. The early part of the Old English period is known as sometimes Dark Ages. What is that period? 410, the time Romans left, uh, until 799. Okay, so around 400 years. Dark Ages. Why it was called Dark Ages? No creative works, no imaginative works, or or no developments actually happened during this. Period. No literary productions were made. There was a lot of demographic imbalance, etc. So this period is known as Dark Ages. Just note down the period. Now, four important dialects of Old English period. You must remember these dialects: Northumbrian, Mercian, Kentish, and the, the most important dialect was West Saxon dialect. West Saxon. Okay. 
and this became the standard in which almost all the all the important texts were written or translated those days. Now, literature of old English period, mainly heroic poetry was composed during that period. What is heroic poetry? Uh, presenting the heroic adventurous exploits or deeds of some heroes. So heroic poetry was uh, the major genre uh, of, okay, of that period. Then major manuscripts, this is very important from the examination point of view. All the poems written during Old English period were collected in four manuscripts. Those four manuscripts and mind you, many of those poems are anonymous. We do not know the names of the actual writers. Nevertheless, all these poems written during that period were collected in four major manuscripts. They are not by number one, except her book. First one, except her book. And uh, this is a 10th century book that contains most of the surviving Old English poetry. So, not the poem, etc. book. I'll come to that very soon. The manuscript was given to etc. cathedral by Bishop Leo Frick. That's how it got the name, etc. book. This bishop had this manuscript. I, we don't know where he got it. He might have got it from somewhere. And he donated it to the etc. cathedral library. That's why this gets the name etc. book. Okay. Second manuscript, Beowulf manuscript. It contains the original poem Beowulf, the old English epic poem, surviving epic poem, and the most important poem of the old English period. Beowulf. Have you heard about this? Okay, I will tell something about it in, in few words when I come to this poem a little later. Okay. It contains the unique copy of the epic poem, Beowulf, and another poem, Judith. I'll tell you what they are. Third manuscript, Junius manuscript. How did it get that name? It contains the so-called Cadmonian poems. Okay, now how did it get this name? Sorry. And how did it get? <laughs> Not how did it get. How did it get its name? It is known after the name Franciscus Junius, who published the first edition of its contents in 1655. That's how it got this name, Junius Manuscript. Now, virtually book, the fourth manuscript, containing some points. It is an anthology of old English prose and words that dates back to the late 10th century, written during until that time. And it gets uh, this name because it was found in the cathedral library at Virtually in Italy. So this gets the name Virtually book. Okay. Major work of the period. The most important work of the period is Beowulf. What is Beowulf? Do you know? Very quickly, maybe in three sentences because it's a long story, but I'll just give an idea. Beowulf is the is the hero of, of this poem, Beowulf. He is the eponym, eponymous protagonist, eponymous the character. And, uh, and the key is a prince uh, uh, in or from modern Switzerland, modern, uh, not modern Switzerland, modern Sweden. Sorry. He is a, a prince from modern Sweden, known as Gitland. Git was uh, 
or engage to other kind of people in, in Sweden in those days. So he, he is a prince now in Hitler, that is in modern Sweden. And then the neighboring country, Denmark, is, is uh, pestered by or disturbed by a, a very, very dangerous monster or a demon uh, known as Gendel. And the king of Denmark is Frogger. And uh, uh, Beowulf's father and uh, Frogger were friends once. So, hearing the jeopardy encountered by Frogger, Beowulf, with a handful of courageous men, come to Denmark and there he is received by the king and the courtiers. And, uh, and uh, they are given a great reception. That evening, there's a lot of drinking and dancing and singing and Grendel who, who, who lives in a nearby marshland uh, is disturbed and, uh, and he comes quite late in the night and attacks the people sleeping in the, in the Met Hall. Met Hall means the entertaining hall. And eventually uh, Beowulf uh, encounters uh, uh, Grendel unarmed. Beowulf is unarmed and with his might and strength he, he attacks uh, Grendel and his right arm is severe. Okay, and with the pain and in agony, he runs away uh, uh, to, to, to his, uh, his dwelling place and there he dies. And his, his uh, severe uh, arm is hung in the back hall. Hearing the news of, uh, of uh, uh, Grendel's uh, death, uh, Grendel's mother, oh, one of the monsters, okay comes and attacks the backward and one of the advisors of Frogger is killed now. Okay, now Beowulf goes in search of uh, Grendel's mother, she's not named, so uh, in the poem, and uh, finally kills her. And uh, now Beowulf and his, his companions uh, leave Denmark with a lot of trophies, a lot of treasures, and, uh, and later on, in England, in, in, in Sweden, uh, Beowulf becomes the king and rules the country for 50 years. And then when he is very old, his country is threatened by another, another dragon. A dragon who, who has been guarding some treasure uh, is disturbed by a robber. And uh, since he is disturbed, he becomes angry and he, he attacks the people there. Finally, Beowulf uh, decides to encounter, to, to challenge the dragon and in the fight, uh, of course, the dragon is killed, but Beowulf is, uh, is uh, wounded and the, the venom of the dragon gets into his blood and he dies. And the people of Hitler, the people of uh, modern, modern Sweden, gives him uh, a great funeral and he is buried on a mound overlooking the sea. This is the story of Beowulf. It's a very long poem, and I will give you the story in a nutshell. From the examination point of view, what you have, what you have to remember is the name Grendel. Okay, the monster. Okay, oh, we don't have much time. Shall we continue? Okay, now it is supposed to have been written between 975, we don't know the exact date. And 1025 during this period, we don't know when it was written, and we do not know who wrote it. Generally known as uh, Beowulf poet, anonymous poet. Okay, and the next one is very important from the examination point of view. The poem Beowulf is written in West Saxon dialect. West Saxon dialect. Remember. Now, it is considered the oldest surviving long epic poem in Old English. Okay. Next one, Judith. Another poem which finds place in Beowulf manuscript is, is Judith and it describes the beheading of Assyrian general Polyphernes by Israelite Judith of Dudulia, a biblical city in, in Israel. So this is the story of Judith. Some important anonymous works of the period appearing in the Exeter book. All these poems are very important. Questions may be asked. Not about the theme as such, but about the names of these poems. Which is the Tamil song? It 
is of 150 diagonals, which is also known as the travel rates saw. Now, sometimes a question may be asked, which is the oldest uh, uh, poem in, in Old English? Some scholars say it is Wittsit, some say it is Cat makes a king. There is no consensus. So, no question setter will ask such questions and give both the objects. No. Uh, if if Wittsit and Cat um, makes him are given as objects or are, are there among the objects or choices, then I think uh, the question setter would have to be flogged. <laughs> okay, that won't happen. Anyway, it is an idealized self-portrait of a minstrel. Minstrel is a musician. It is about that uh, musician's uh, uh, autobiography, like, okay, of the Germanic heroic age who wandered from place to place, went to different, uh, say, kingdoms and entertained uh, different kings or princes and queens and courtiers. So, which is or the tablet song is all about the experience of this musician, this minstrel, who has traveled all around uh, uh, and to, who has entertained a lot of people in different uh, kingdoms. Okay, The Wanderer is another poem which is found in the etc. book. It contains 150 lines and written in alliterative words. Old English uses alliteration, whereas you will find in Middle English, alliteration will be replaced by rhyme. What is alliteration? Now you know why we have discussed all these uh, uh, figures of speech and uh, meter and prosody. You will realize why as we go ahead. Alliteration means successive words, uh, you know, uh, having the same uh, constant sound. See, Sorry, she sells, she shells on the seashore. This was the pattern employed by old English poetry. Okay, what is this poem? The wanderer. It focuses uh, uh, on the on the on the loss of a, of a person. What is the loss? Loss of his lord. The person has lost his lord, his master, and he is very sad, and and he is grieving over the death of his master. And he feels that he is all desolate and abandoned without his master. Okay, and uh, he leaves his uh, home and his, his, his place of birth and looking for what wisdom and knowledge. This is the, uh, the content of the poem. The seafarer this deals with the loneliness experienced by uh, a man on the sea. An account of a man alone on the sea. Just imagine if you are alone on the sea, what would be your loneliness? That is the subject matter of this poem, the seafarer. The wife's lament. Oh, it's very clear. The wife is uh, so sad, so depressed, so despondent because she feels that her husband uh, does not love her uh, any longer. So this is uh, an account of her feelings of being estranged from her husband or being abandoned by her husband. The wife's lament. The husband's message. Yeah, here is a story of a man uh, who has to leave his his home because of a feud, a quarrel with someone, and he is uh, separated from his wife. And it is not very clear from the poem whether it is wife or or his girlfriend. Whatever. And uh, after a few years, he sends a letter and message uh, professing his love for her, and he he he, he eagerly longs to be united with her. And uh, he he pleads with her that when he sits down, please unite with him, join him. That is the content of the poem, the husband's message. Very simple poem. Poems appearing in other manuscripts. There are three more manuscripts. In other manuscripts of the period, uh, some poems appear. Among them, the most important ones I am discussing with you. Whatever I am discussing, please, are important. Okay. Waldir. This is actually not an independent autonomous poem. This is part of an old English epic. And it consists of 63 lines. What is this? It tells some of the exploits of Walter of Aquitaine. 
water of Aquitaine, a legendary king of Visigoths. Who are these Visigoths? A Germanic tribe. Now, in Germany in those days, there were many tribes like the Angles, the Jews, the Saxons, whatnot. Now, here, Visigoths. So, this talks about the, 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 the advantage, the exploits, the heroic deeds of this legendary king, uh, Walter Aquitaine, that is Waldir. Wal it is pronounced Waldir. Okay. The fight at Finsburg, another poem. It's called 48 lines in length. It narrates the war or the conflict between Germanic uh, uh, tribe known as Frisians and some Danish people. A fight between uh, a Germanic group and uh, a group uh, from, from Denmark. That's all, two tribes. Okay. The Battle of Brandenburg. Sorry. The Battle of Brandenburg. Brandenburg. What is this? It relates the victory of the Saxon king Athelstan. Athelstan. Saxon king Athelstan. Saxon means already in England now. Okay. Saxon king Athelstan over the allied forces of, of three kings. What are they? Uh, Olaf uh, Gudfredsen, king of Dublin, Ireland, and Constantine the second, king of Scotland, and Owain, king of Strathclyde. These three kings together formed an army and fought against the Saxon king in England. What was his name? King Athelstan. Athelstan. And uh, Athelstan won. So this is celebrated uh, in the poem, the Battle of Brandenburg. The battle took place there. Okay. The Battle of Malden, another poem. It describes the defeat of the Anglo-Saxons. If there is victory, there is also defeat. If there is pain, there is also pressure. If there is success, there can also be failure. Okay. Against a Viking invasion in 993. Viking, what is Viking? They were from Denmark. Very aggressive group of people, tribes. And they went on, you know, invading, uh, ransacking, you know, pillaging and uh, pirating, what sort of things they did, all the, all the wicked, barbarous things. Okay. Now, Vikings were Scandinavians who were brutal pagan invaders. Not only from Scandinavia, they were also from Denmark. Okay, so these were a brutal group of people. And uh, Anglo Saxons lost one battle against uh, these, these barbarians. And that is uh, uh, mentioned or in, the, in the poem, the Battle of Malden. Okay, next one. Famous writers of old English fiction. So far, we have seen only some poems, anonymous poems. Okay, we have seen poems, but we do not know who were actually the real authors of those of those poems. We only know uh, some poems, and we have seen those poems. Remember all those points. These are the most important ones. Nothing else can be asked from this video. Now we come to some individual points because their works are recorded and we know who wrote what. Canman, 7th century, he lived and wrote, is called the, the Anglo Saxon Milton. From the examination point of view, it's very important. Anglo Saxon Milton. We have a Milton later on uh, in the 17th century. We have a Milton, John Milton. Uh, but here, Cadman belongs to the, the old English period and he is known as the Anglo Saxon Milton. That means he was quite a famous poet of those days. Now, his works. Number one, the King. 
This is often considered to be the oldest poem along with Whitsitt. It's a nine line poem, very short poem, praising God. That's all. And uh, other poems uh, attributed to Cadman are Genesis, that is based on the Bible, uh, which talks about the first chapter of the Bible, where, where the story of creation is narrated. Then Exodus, this is the this is, uh, second book, where the Israelites were moved from, from Egypt and uh, finally their promised land. Then Daniel, another, another king in the, in the Old Testament. Then Christ and Satan. These are the, these are the other poems of Catherine. Bede, sometimes he is known as Saint Bede or, or Venerable Bede in, in, in Christian religion. Uh, virtuous people are, are are made into saint or they are they are given that kind of status within the within the hierarchy of the church or within the system of the church. So venerable be okay. He was an English Benedictine monk. Benedictine is like a congregation. Okay, a name was started by a person by this name. A congregation of monks who who lead a purely religious life, like you know. You have around it here, we have uh, the Salations or the, the CMI or other congregations of sisters and priests. So, Benedictine monk, a right, congregation. Um, so what is he famous for? See, his ecclesiastical history of the English people is a very famous book written by him. It is a, a vital source of, of understanding the history of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxon tribes to Christianity. Okay, remember St. Augustine landed in, in England in 597 and then with him started the conversion of, of these pagans, Anglo-Saxons, uh, to Christianity. Okay, so you get an account of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxon pagan tribes to Christianity. That's all about this book. Now, this one, Kinahul, it is not to pronounce as uh, uh, Sainiwul, it is Kinahul, 8th century, he lived in 8th century, we have no precise date of his birth or death, he is the greatest of Anglo-Saxon poets, that much we know, Kinahul, let's look at some of his works, Andreas, it tells the story of St. Andrews, the Apostle. He was okay, one of the apostles uh, okay, of, of Jesus. Another one, the face uh, of the apostles. The face of the apostles, as you know, uh, many of the disciples, apostles of Jesus, uh, were persecuted, not many, all of them, and they were killed uh, or tortured or stoned to death or, or crucified, like St. Peter, with his head uh, upside down. Jesus was crucified with his head up, and uh, when Peter was also about to be crucified, he requested to crucify him with his head upside down. Okay, so almost all the apostles of Jesus were, were uh, tortured and uh, crucified or martyred and killed. Okay, this 122 line poem narrates the key events uh, that subsequently happened to the uh, apostles of, of Jesus after his ascension to, to heaven. Okay. Christ, it comprises how many? 1664 lines. Very long poem which, which deals with Christ's birth, his, his coming into this world, his, his mission, his, his ascension into heaven and also talks about the final judgment that when Jesus Christ will return to this world to judge the people. I think uh, you, most of you know this. Okay. Then Ellen is another poem. What is this? Uh, also known as Saint Helena finds the true cross. It is 1321 long poem. What is Ellen? You know Jesus was crucified on a cross. 
and that cross was then the eternal cross. And it is uh, believed that Ellen uh, found this cross somewhere in a well uh, in, in Israel. So this poem talks about that. Now, who is this uh, Ellen? The poem is the first English account of the finding of the Holy Cross by Saint Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine. You know Emperor Constantine. We will see more about him when we come to Renaissance. Okay. So this poem talks about those events of or those events leading to the finding of the cross on which Jesus was crucified. I read it by uh, uh, Saint Helena, the mother of the uh, Emperor Constantine. Okay, Juliana is another uh, another moving uh, authentic poem. It's uh, of uh, seven hundred thirty one lines, and uh, it is preserved in the Exeter book. What is this about? It is an account of, of the torture, the humiliation, the pain, sufferings undergone by Juliana, on whom a man called, or a, or a Roman officer, uh, Eleusius, had a knife. And he, he made a lot of advances to her. But she, she being a very faithful Christian believer, refused to surrender to his, his uh, you know, sexual passions. And finally, she was tortured and murdered. So those events are presented in this poem, Juliana. The Dream of the Road is a very important book. Please, uh, not the name. The Dream of the Road. Okay. All these poems are written by in a wolf. Okay. It is an address of the saved soul to the body. Okay. The soul now is uh, saved. And now I think uh, despising the body and telling a lot of things. Okay. That is the, uh, I think, uh, the major thing. But this is written in the dream vision genre. What is this dream vision genre? This is very important from the examination point of view. You will find this genre being practiced by Chaucer in many of his poems. All of that when we come to Chaucer. Now, here, what is dream vision genre? It means the narrator or the poet imagines himself or herself in a state of dream or dreaming of something. In that dream, something happens. And whatever the poet wants to say is presented through a dream. That is known as a dream vision genre. Okay. Now, root means crucifix. In a dream, the unknown poet, you don't know who is the speaker here, yes. beholds a beautiful tree. It's a dream, a tree. That is the root or cross. Here the meaning is the cross or the, or, or the wood on which Christ died. So the narrator dreams of a cross on which Christ died. Okay. Now this cross in its dream tells him the story. The story of the cross. Okay. Now the cross tells uh, it has been forced okay, uh, uh, to, to, to suffer the nail wounds. Okay, the nails, the, you know, Jesus was crucified on the cross, so the nails pierced through his body, okay, into the, into the wood, into the cross, okay. Now, the wood, then the spear shafts, the, 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 the torture that, that the cross received, of course, of course through Christ, uh, from the soldiers around, and the insults that, uh, that, that the cross received, along with Christ, to fulfill what? God's will. So the cross says, along with Christ, it also has suffered all sorts of pains and humiliations. And uh, this is narrated in a dream vision. And once blood stained, what? The cross, the root. Once blood stained and horrible, it is now the resplendent, the brilliant sign of mankind's redemption. Why mankind's redemption cross becomes? Because uh, Christians believe that Jesus came into the world and Christians believe he is the incarnation of, of God himself. Many of us don't believe. Uh, I mean, it's a matter of belief for, for anyone who is looking for religion. And, uh, and through his death, our sins are washed away and we all, all are ensured a place in heaven. 
So now for crystals, this cross is uh, very, 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 very holy, very sacred cross because on the cross he died, and that cross uh, is symbol of of human redemption. Okay. Next one, cross writers of the period. One after the great, after the great was a great, great cross writer of of Anglo Saxon. Or old English period. Remember that he was the king of Wessex from 871 to 899. King of Wessex. And Wessex was the most predominant kingdom at that time. Alfred the Great's translations. Most of the works are translations. Very quickly, let us look at it. Pastoral care of Pope Gregory. Pope, you know who Pope, the head of the Catholic Church. And uh, pastoral care means whatever advice or sermons that he gives. So that is translated into, into English. Then history of the world of Orisius, a Spanish cleric. This uh, cleric brought history of the world of Orisius. That means history of the world was written by Orisius. That is translated into English by Alfred. In Alfred, okay. Uh, Ecclesiastical history of B, B, uh, Venerable B, also wrote uh, the history of what is that? Ecclesiastical history, the conversion of, of the Anglo Saxons to Christianity. This also uh, uh, was translated by Alfred. Okay. Then, consolation of philosophy of Boethius, it's very important, not doubt, Boethius. Constellation of Philosophy. Constellation of Philosophy is the title of the book by Boethius, who was the prominent senator philosopher of the 6th century. Okay. Then, Soliloquies of St. Augustine. St. Augustine's uh, no, Soliloquies means so in the one term. Was his own revelation. Whatever he, he has, uh, has spoken to, that is uh, translated into. Now, other prose writers, very quickly. Alfred is best known for his grammar. So, Alfred of the middle, so not middle, of the old English or Anglo Saxon period is known for his grammar. Okay. Wolfstan or Lupus. He is known as Lupus or Wolfstan. His most famous work is the Sermo Lupi and Anglos. In English, Servant of wolf to the English. Here, wolf is not that animal. He is uh, now by his nickname called wolf. So, uh, servant of wolf to the English. Whatever servants he delivered to the people of, of England or people around him, uh, this is another book. Okay, of wolf stand or Lucas. And though, this is the last, I, I think I have more or less stated the time. This is the last piece of information that I want to give you from Old English period. Anglo Saxon Chronicle. That is, the history of Anglo Saxons was first assembled in the reign of King Alfred, as I already said, during his reign in 71 to uh, sorry, uh, uh, 899. From 871 to 899. Anglo Saxon Chronicle means the history of the people known as Anglo Saxons who came from Germany after the Romans left uh, uh, England uh, in 410 CE. And uh, then they continued to establish themselves in different kingdoms. So, okay, Angles one region, Saxons another region, Jews another region, and the Vikings another region. Was written to so many domains. All these things will end very soon when we see next lesson. Okay, by 1066, Anglo Saxon rule will end and a new, a new, very, very brand new rule will be established in England. That is known as the Norman rule. Let's wait for that. Maybe tomorrow we will begin that lesson. Till then, please, may I remind you, all the points that I have discussed here, and the writers I have discussed here, 
are very important. You forget everything else and write out the names of the partners. And wherever the others are known, their names and their points. You have a notebook. You must have one only for the history of English literature from old English till the contemporary period. I will be going in this fashion systematically, taking each age important works. Now, Middle English, then Peter Savior, then Chaucer, then Elizabethan, it will go on like that. Okay, then, I hope you have understood uh, to a great extent. Some things are new to you, some things are already known to you. All the same, this will help you. Okay, then, take care, be happy, till we meet for the next lesson on Middle English.